All right, so welcome to the second talk uh, this day in our hottest conference of 2020. Uh, we're lucky to have Paige North as our next speaker uh, from Ohio State University, and she will talk about a higher structure identity principle. Yep, so um, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, of course, but also for having this um, virtual conference with their expertise in the subject matter so that we can all see each other um, this summer. So I'm going to be talking about um, a higher structure identity principle, and this is joint work with Benedict Ahrens, Mike Schulman, and Demetrius Simensis. Um, it's been going on for a while, as most people probably know. Um, so there are some links here on the title page. The first one um, is a link to the actual slides. So I find myself, um, when I see other people's slides on my computer screen, wanting to um, go back and forth. For some reason, I have that urge. So if anyone else does, you can go to the slides there and uh, follow along. And um, also a preprint um, is available on the archive. Um, but I should also say that an extended abstract version of this um, has been published in Lix. OK, so here's the um, outline. So most of this um, is going to be motivation, actually. Um, and even though we are um, we are motivated to work on this to extend the um, structure identity principle to higher structures like higher categories and things like that. Um, a lot of the talk will actually be about results that we can find in lower set level structures, um, which will, I think, elucidate the subject and is a bit easier to talk about since there's just less data there. Okay, so here's some very um, basic motivation. So in Martin Lift type theory, we always have, of course, a synthetic, you might say, equality type between any two terms of a type D. So we just have the um, identity type. And uh, we also often have um, another notion of equality or sameness um, depending on the type T. And so we might call this analytic if we're thinking about um, group isomorphisms or categorical equivalences some notion of sameness, which is built out of um, a bunch of maps back and forth and um, various coherence properties. Okay, so these two notions of equality are both useful for different things. Um, so we might, uh, from experience, know that the analytic equalities are useful because that's usually how um, they appear in our mathematical work. We usually think about actual categorical equivalences and not equalities between categories or something. Um, but of course, we also like the equality type because it's uh, so easy to use. It has such a nice um, definition. Uh, so we want to use the good properties of both of these types of equality. And so we might um, call a univalence principle um, something that says that these two um, types of equality are equivalent. So just for people who are very new to the subject, if there are any out there, um, just to be clear, the univalence axiom in type theory states that the notion of equality between two types is the same as um, the notion of equivalence between two types. Okay, so now um, to get a bit philosophical, why do we like um, the notion of the synthetic equality so much? Um, well, Leibniz, a long time ago, uh, suggested that two things should be equal when they are indiscernible. So if two guys, A and B, have all the same properties, then they should be equal. Of course, this presupposes um, the kind of obvious notion that two equal things should have the same properties. So we should have this um, bijection. And let's um, bump this up to something that looks a bit more type theoretic. We would change some of the um, by implications to equivalences and the for all to a pi. And this, um, fact holds in Martin Luff type theory. So if two guys A and B are equal in the terms of the identity type, then of course they share all the same properties. Um, but we often want to say isomorphic groups or equivalent categories to also share the same properties. So if we had a univalence principle for those two guys that said that equality of groups is the same as group isomorphism, then we would find um, what people such as Peter Axel have talked about in terms of the structure identity principle, which is that um, if you have uh, one of these equivalences, like an isomorphism between two groups, 
then you'll also find that those two groups have the same properties. So that's the thing that we want really when we do mathematics. If we prove um, an equivalence or an isomorphism, constructing maps back and forth, and all the coherence properties that we want, um, we would want to say that those two objects then have all the same properties. We actually often even assume that without um, going too much into the details. Okay, so our goal is to find um, a large class of higher structures, so something that um, might be akin to a bi-category or a tri-category and, and things like that, and notions um, of equivalence between them that kind of automatically um, validate a univalence principle. And then this will give us um, a structure identity principle without any more work. So I want to point out that um, we are building off of two pieces of work. The first is first order logic with dependent sorts, which is which predates homotopy type theory, but is very reminiscent of homotopy type theory. And um, the second is more recent work in homotopy type theory, univalent categories, and the rest completion, which really kind of pointed the way um, forward to this kind of work. Okay, so um, that was it for the philosophical motivation. Now I'll talk about um, what we've done in terms of some lower structure identity principles. Okay, so first to orient ourselves, here's something that is um, very trivial for someone who's used already to um, homotopy type theory. So we have, um, if we're in univalence foundation, so we have the univalence axiom for all types, then we have this kind of univalence for propositions um, saying that for any two propositions, P and Q, the identity type between P and Q is equivalent to the type of bi implications between P and Q. And this is just because, of course, the type of bi implications between P and Q is the same as equivalences as types between P and Q. And from this um, tiny theorem, we automatically find a structure identity principle for propositions. If we have two propositions, P and Q, um, that are equivalent to each other, then we have uh, that they satisfy all the same properties. Okay, so now let's start talking about um, something a bit more interesting. So I want to talk about magmas um, because they, so all the examples here I have are, are low set level structures that are, you might say, a bit pathological because they um, kind of bring out the, um, the stuff that we see on the higher levels and higher categories that we're working on, but at the set level. So a magma is a set M with just a binary operation. So okay, start with a monoid and take away basically everything, you have a magma. Um, so we don't have an identity element or anything like that. Uh, so there are two notions of sameness that we can consider between two elements, M and N, of a magma. We can consider, of course, the normal equality that comes from the identity type of martin Lift type theory. Or we can um, consider a notion of indiscernibility. So this is, um, of course, the word is inspired by Leibniz's um, principle, but this is not quite exactly the same as what he was saying because he was talking about all properties and here we're just, we're just um, noting a few properties. But we want to say that M and N are indiscernible as members of this magma if they behave the same as members of the magma. So if whenever we multiply on the right, um, they give the same thing. If whenever we multiply on the left, they do the same thing. Um, and uh, if we have two guys that become M when we multiply them together, and then they also become N. Okay, and so note, of course, that since we um, don't have an identity element, and we don't know if M and N are actually the product of two things, then we can't say that this implies that they're actually equal. Okay, so we have two notions of equality, one that's the standard one, and one that just says that M and N, as members of the magma, are indistinguishable. They behave exactly the same. And of course, this produces two notions of equivalence of magmas. So we um, could consider a notion of equivalence up to usual equality, where we consider two magma homomorphisms going in each direction, F and G, um, such that uh, the composite of G and F is equal to M, or equal to the identity, I should say, um, and likewise for FG. Or we could consider basically the same thing, but now we want uh, each FGM to be indiscernible from M, not actually equal. So these two notions of equality inside the magma produce two different notions of equivalence between two magmas. 
Okay, so here are some other examples. Um, so we can think about pre-orders, which is interesting because it's kind of a, a very impoverished category. So a pre-order, um, just to orient everyone, is a set P together with a reflexive transitive relation, which we often write as less than or equals. Um, and then we, with this information, we would say that two elements, P and Q, of a pre-order P are indiscernible if they look exactly the same um, as members of the pre-order. So if they're less than all the same things, if they're greater than all the same things, and if we have this bifurcation, which of course is um, trivial. But if we can just use the axioms of um, pre-orders to find that this kind of long explanation is um, equivalent to this rather um, short description of an indiscernibility. So just if P is less than or equal to Q and Q is less than or equal to P. Okay, so we can also consider topological spaces. So we can say a topological space um, is a set T together with a collection of sets, subsets of T, which we call open, um, satisfying all the usual things. And then we would say that two elements S and T of a topological space T are indiscernible if, now I've written in kind of a, a strange way that um, goes back to how I've formulated it, but if S um, is a member of U, if and only if T is a member of U for every set, every open set U of T. Okay, so the reason why I'm talking about this, just to foreshadow what's happening, um, is that equivalences between higher categorical structures are usually up to indiscernibility, or up to this um, isomorphism sub i kind of symbol. We don't think about usually um, maps between categories back and forth whose composites are actually equal on the nose um, to the identity. We're thinking about them as being isomorphic to the identity. So even at the set level, we see um, a shadow of what we are trying to capture in the higher categorical world. Does anybody have any questions at this moment? Hi, uh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. In the example of the magma, I didn't understand. How is that by implication not, uh, how does that by implication not imply that the two elements are equal? Yeah, so you don't know that M and N are the product of any two things. So it's ah, very it's, different it's from what you product. are used to. And they're equal, okay. Yeah, so since we don't have an identity element, then like M isn't equal to M times one. We can't reduce okay. it in that way. Yeah, so that's the reason why I'm sticking with the weird notion of magmas and not something more normal like monoids. Okay, yeah, good question. I, I thought that would come up. Okay, so um, those are our three examples of set level structures that have interesting notions of indiscernibilities. And then um, if we go back to this um, notion of uh, equivalence with respect to the actual equality, not indiscernibility, then we have this theorem for magmas and also pre-orders and topological spaces, which is that um, given two magmas M and N, the uh, equality type between M and N is equivalent to the type of these equality-based um, isomorphisms. So this is um, this and the, the case for pre-orders and topological spaces is a special case of the general result, which is they're called the structure identity principle um, for a class of structures on sets that is called standard in the hot book. Okay, so we always have this, um, this equivalence between real um, equality and this equality-based isomorphism um, that comes from this, this standard result. Okay, so the question is, um, since in a lot of cases we're more interested in um, isomorphism up to indiscernibility, not equality, can we hope for the same with um, this, this isomorphism? Because we want to tie together this isomorphism and equality um, so that we can get the, both, the, the best of both worlds. And the answer um, is in general no. So in particular, if we thought about um, magmas, we have this projection uh, function that takes any magma to its underlying set. So if we had um, an equivalence like this, then we would um, get an equivalence, uh, I should say an isomorphism of sets actually, um, between their underlying sets, making um, this guy basically an equivalence just up to equality. So we just look at the set level and we see an isomorphism of sets, which is not, not what we want. So to make this more concrete, I have this, this example here. Um, 
which is a shadow of an example you might have seen in categories for the same concept. So if we consider two post sets, which here I'm illustrating um, as categories. So let's consider the post set um, one who has underlying set just one element. And here we have a post set, let's call it two, who has as underlying set two elements, uh, let's say A and B, where A is less than equal to B and B is less than equal to A. Then um, as post sets with this notion of indiscernibility, these two guys are equivalent because you might have noticed if you're a category theorist that this notion of indiscernibility is just a notion of equivalence of post sets as categories. Um, so of course, these two guys um, should be equivalent in that way. But um, if we had this univalence, if, we, if that meant that these two guys were actually equal, then we would see in particular that the underlying sets are equal, which of course they're not. One is not equal to two. Okay, but this points the way to um, the types of things for which we can have this univalence. So we can have this univalence if we identify equality in the, in the um, actual set and in the discernibility. So we want to tie these two things together. Okay, so how do we do that? So now we're going to use um, formulation by uh, Mackay, his first order logic with dependent sorts. Um, and he, he proposed to describe algebraic structures in this way. So um, an inverse category he defined to be a strict category, uh, let's say i, and a function from i to the natural numbers whose fibers are discrete. And uh, then we can talk about the height of an inverse category, which is the maximum value of n that it attains. So um, we are considering as signatures for our um, algebraic gadgets, um, just inverse categories of finite height. So here are um, three examples. So we have um, first the signature for magmas. So like I said, a magma is a set with this multiplication. So we have uh, here guy O that says there needs to be an underlying set. And um, this trinary relation M that's underlying the binary function M. And uh, here's the signature for process. So again, we um, have at the bottom a type O of the elements and a type A, which is a binary relation on the element saying um, X is equal to Y. And here I've um, given the signature for something a bit more complicated, just to make it more interesting. Um, which is that for groups. So for groups, we have, um, and I should have maybe had another sort here, but I guess there's a choice actually. So um, here we have the a notion of identity, here of equality, here of multiplication um, for groups, and also we could have um, an inverse uh, binary relation, saying that one guy is inverse of another guy. Okay, so let's talk about that um, a bit more. So what is a structure for one of these signatures? Well, it's kind of what I already suggested. Um, and roughly we think of um, a structure for a signature L as a functor from one of these um, categories into the universe U. But we um, write this down, we kind of use it more as a recipe and write it down um, using dependent types and not just as a functor. So a um, L process structure S is first of all a um, type SO. So we're thinking of this as mapping this, um, this whole diagram into type. So we have a type SO here. And then for A, we're going to notate this or um, describe it more in terms of the, the fibers. Um, so for every two guys in O, we have the fiber, so every two guys that say x, y, and o, we have the fiber a, x, y. So we're asking that there be a type s, a, x, y for every x, y, and o. And um, we, of course, mean by this that x is less than or equal to y. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so um, we can also describe L magma structures for this. Um, signature here. So again, we just ask for a type SO 
And for every three um, terms of O, we ask for a um, type that represents the fiber. So we ask for a type SM XYZ for every X, Y, Z, and O, meaning um, that Z is the product of X and Y. So a lot of these algebraic structures, of course, um, can be formulated in terms of functions, like M is a, a function, but everything here is a relation. Um, and then we will impose axioms on these structures, um, saying that uh, the pro set is reflexive and stuff like that, but we won't get too much into that in this talk. Okay, so we were talking about um, indiscernibilities just kind of ad hoc before, but this formulation of the structure of these um, kinds of things of pro sets and magmas gives us a recipe for um, what an indiscernibility should be. So let's consider um, indiscernibilities between um, just elements of the, the bottom type of L pro set structures. So we want to say that, is someone asking a question? Someone have a question? Oh, what is, oh yeah, good question. I should have said that. So pro set is just short for um, pre-ordered set. Someone asked what does pro set mean? So pro set just is short for pre-ordered set. Thanks, I meant to say that. Okay, so, um, okay, just looking at the chat. All right, so um, we wanna know what an indiscernibility is between two um, elements of our underlying type of a pro set. And I already um, gave the answer before, but here we see how to do it kind of formulaically. So we wanna say that um, what it should mean for two guys to be indiscernible in a pro set is that their behavior in the pro set is exactly the same. And since the um, behavior is just um, illustrated by what's going on with A here, right? The A is um, standing for this guy that's equal to that guy. We wanna say that every way that we can put Q, uh, P and Q into these relations um, should be the same, if that makes sense. So A should not be able to tell the difference between P and Q. So um, for every X, if we look at S A P of X, that should look exactly the same as S A Q of X. So if you replace P and Q, it should look exactly the same. And here um, S A X P should be the same as S A X Q. And also if we replace P and Q twice in A, then those should also look the same. So we see, um, I haven't exactly given the formula, but you can see how from one of these signatures, you can formulaically write down what an indiscernibility is. So, uh, sorry, um, if you had a term in the first two bullets here, so a, a proof that for all X and S naught, S A P X is, you know, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like you could specialize the first proof to the case P and the second proof to the case Q and compose the isomorphisms to get a proof that SAPP is isomorphic to SAQQ. So I'm wondering yeah. why that's also included as data. Yeah, good question. So here in this slide, I'm just formulaically writing down naively what, this, what the signature says. Right? So, so I'm just not thinking about it. I'm just saying, okay, let's just replace P and Q in every which way. And then later I can come back and give a more intelligent description. I guess the, uh, I mean, the first two statements seem more intuitive to me from the point of view of the signature than the third, because it's using a diagonal. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, don't I, don't know know if I, I don't know I if I have a very good reason. Um, sorry. You should just keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we do it like this and, uh, it works out. But, but this is, um, yeah, like I was saying, like uh, a lot of this will collapse when we actually think about it. Okay. And perhaps, so, perhaps it might be worth saying that when, 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 you, when Paige gives the general formulation, that this is what's going to pop out of the general formulation. So I think that's sort of why she's saying it this way. This yeah. Way. Yeah. And there's something even more general in the background of that makes this come out. Yeah. Great. Sorry for interrupting. Keep going. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay. So does anybody else have any questions while I'm already paused? 
Okay, so then we can ask what um, are indiscernibilities between two bottom level elements of the magma structure. So the guys that we're thinking of as being the elements of the underlying set. And again, this is a, a lot more data, but we just um, formulaically replace uh, in, so let's go back to the signature actually. So here we have the signature. So the only thing that um, is saying how things in O behave is this guy M. So we just replace um, in M uh, one spot by M or N in every way we can, and then sp stipulate that those guys are equivalent. So if we look at M, M, X, Y, that should be the same as M, N, X, Y, and so on and so forth for every one of these guys. And here we see um, that we're replacing two instances of M with two instances of N, and here all three instances of M with all three instances of N. Okay, so we've just talked about indiscernibilities let me go back again, sorry. Indiscernibilities of elements um, in O, but why wouldn't we talk about indiscernibilities of elements in A? I mean, O is the bottom element, but otherwise there's nothing that different between A and O. So we certainly can. And now we wanna say, and the answer is already here, but we wanna say that um, two terms of this A type, which are living at the top, are indiscernibility if they behave in the same way with respect to everyone as governing their behavior. And of course, there's nobody governing their behavior. So an indiscernibility consists of nothing between these two guys. So in particular, every two elements of one of these types are trivially indiscernible. Okay, and now we have, um, I think, enough information to define what a univalent structure of a signature is. So we say a structure M of a signature L is univalent if the type of indiscernibilities between any two terms of any one sort, and I haven't defined the word sort yet, but the sorts are these kinds of things. So all the A, P, Qs, or the M, X, Y, Z, stuff like that. Um, so if any two terms, if the type of indiscernibilities between any two terms of a given sort is equivalent to the type of equalities between them as elements of, of that type, as in here. So we're tying together the equalities and the indiscernibilities, which um, is what I motivated in a few slides ago. Okay, so in particular, if we do this, this means that all the top level sorts, like all of these SAPQs and all process structures are propositions because every guy will have to be trivially equal to every other guy. And then um, since the equalities um, of the next level down, which is, here in these examples, the bottom level, since the equalities are composed of, um, well, here I've written them as equivalences, but if the top level is already um, supposed to be a proposition, then these will be um, by implications between propositions. So since the equalities between elements of these bottom sorts are going to be collections of by implications between propositions, then they will be sets because their equality types will be propositions. So you see um, that there's some restriction on the H levels of these guys. Okay, so let's um, look at what univalence means for these examples. So um, for the L process structures, say we have a structure S, we wanna know uh, what it means to be univalent. So um, maybe I, I should have said this more explicitly. So now I'll, um, go back here a bit and say that um, if our structure is univalent, then each one of these uh, six types that we see here should be a proposition. So these equivalences are gonna be um, by implications. And so this is saying, as I said um, now, many slides ago, let me go back to this slide. So if we write it instead of with A, um, with less than equals, and we see all of this data, and as I said before, all of that data is equivalent to saying that P is less than equal to Q and Q is less than equal to P. So that's what um, one of these indiscernibilities is equivalent to in a univalent structure. Okay, so um, S is fully univalent if when, um, first of all, when each of these um, relations P less than equal to Q is a proposition, but then also on the the second level when this equality type is equivalent to the type of 
um, indiscernibilities between P and Q. Um, and so you might recognize this as the definition of a post set, right? This is um, giving us anti-symmetry. So whenever P is less than or equal to Q and Q is less than or equal to P, we would then say that P is, P is equal to Q. So a benevolent pro set is a pro set. And now we can look at um, magma structures, which is maybe a little bit less illuminating, but those are univalent when, again, each of the top level sorts um, is a proposition. So the, the guy that's saying um, M times N is equal to P only has one witness. And this canonical map that takes equalities M equals N to um, this big guy, which is, again, um, simplification of exactly the requirements that M and N are indiscernible, is an equivalence. OK, and now we can think um, again about topological spaces, which we haven't talked too much about. But just to give a gist of what's going on there, um, a topological space T is univalent when each of the, the top level sorts is a proposition. But more interestingly, when this um, canonical map from x equals y into um, the statement that for all open sets u and t, x is in u, if and only if y is in u, is an equivalence. And this, just like um, the situation with prosets, um, has a, a name in mathematics, which is that t must be a t0 space. So t0 space is one where um, uh, points are distinguishable by open sets. OK, so we get some interesting notions when we look at univalent structures. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, uh, hi Paige, I'm a bit confused yeah. about the magma case and this F, where you say mx equals nx. Um, so, but a, a magma structure, is, it's not actually a magma, right? Am I, think, am I right in saying that the magma structure is not actually a magma? Yeah, so um, I'm kind of sweeping under the rug any axioms that we might impose on a magma? So, would, so, so I, 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 just, I just don't understand how to read this mx equals nx. All you have is this, you have this ternary, essentially this ternary relation. And is this a kind, this is a, some kind of informal way of expressing something? Yeah, I'm sweeping a lot of stuff under the rug here. Um, yeah, so okay. if we have some axioms that say that, um, expressing like x, y, z as x, y equals z makes sense, then we can write it this way. Okay. Okay. That makes it a bit clearer. Thanks. Yeah. I have another question. Yeah. In the slide 13, uh, in which you define this, this um, universe, the signatures, what does a function from a category mean? Um, I think I mean a functor. Yeah, that's a typo. Thanks. Okay, okay, but then you are uh, looking at the natural numbers as w w which category is that? Yeah, so yeah, I, I haven't um, written this, this slide very well. Yeah, so it's a functor and um, we have arrows like from one to zero, so maybe n op, we might say. Okay. So the idea is that um, this row, which stands for rank, um, would so we would map this oops, would map this um, category to sending m to one and o to zero, and um, it would say that m has rank one. And here we would send i, e, and m to one and o to zero. And so these three guys all have rank one, and this guy has rank zero. Okay. Effectively, we are counting the number of arrows. Um, not not the number of arrows exactly but the number of kind of, uh, um, so with, with anyone, with a more complicated signature, you can stratify the categories in different ways. So okay. this isn't actually unique. Um, I don't know if that's what you're asking. But we're, we're kind of okay. um, trying to stratify the category basically. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, right. So, okay, so we have these um, three interesting things that pop out of considering the what structures. And um, so now I wanna talk about um, a bit more of the intricacies and categories. Okay, so 
um, we can define the data of a category to be the following. So we can give the signature for category in this way. So this guy, um, if we map these two guys to two and one and zero, then this guy has height two. And um, so we can give the signature and then we can say that the data for a category that is a structure for one of these signatures is a type C of O. So we're thinking of C as a functor from this signature into um, U. And um, then we, we give all the fibers. So for every two guys, X and Y in U, we want a type A, X, Y. And then um, I should have said, we also, of course, impose relations on these, um, on the composites of these morphisms. So we want that um, the two arrows from I to O are equal. And we want um, these composites to look like um, the beginning of simplex category, stuff like that. So, um, right, so we also want uh, a type uh, C i of um, every arrow f that lives in a, an a, x, x, and so on and so forth. So we, we have um, a type in each one of these fibers. All right, so um, yeah, so I should, I should say that this i is a kind of well, relation, or maybe better said, the property um, of an arrow that's saying that this arrow is the identity. And this T is a trinary um, relation that's like the multiplication of a magma, which is saying that the composite F and G is H. So that's, so that's what we're thinking of. Um, now, I talked a little bit about axioms in here. They kind of come in, um, they kind of butt their head in a bit more than before, which is that we want to add axioms like this. And um, don't feel compelled to read this, but it just says that composites are unique. So you want to say that if we have two, um, two different composites of the same guy, then those two composites should be the same. Um, so here we're using equality. And we want to, um, maybe for technical reasons, I guess, we want to put this equality in um, explicitly into the signature. Um, so we can do that. Here, so we have an equality predicate on A saying these two arrows are equal. And then a structure for this signature includes um, all of the, the types for E. And then we would um, change this equality to um, uh, being phrased in terms of this E. Okay, so now let's ask what a univalent LCAT structure is. So maybe let's imagine that on all of this data, we've put the axioms of a category. So this, this is behaving like a category. So we want to understand what um, a univalent LCAT structure is. And just like in the set level uh, case, in the height one case, all of these top level guys, all these top level sets, um, or every two elements of these top level sets should be indiscernible, right? Because there's nothing above them that can distinguish between them. Um, and so if we want to make this, if you want to um, stipulate that this structure is univalent, then that means that each of these top level uh, sorts is a proposition. And so hopefully that makes sense because we would think like the property of being an identity arrow should be a proposition, not have any more data than that. Okay, now at the next level, um, I won't write out the details, but I'll just say that um, if we impose axioms as we do, that E is a congruence for T and I, so E behaves like equality with respect to T and I, then that automatically makes um, this, that automatically makes the notion of indiscernibility between any two arrows reduced to um, this uh, E. So if we want the category to be univalent, then that means that the equality type between any two arrows is exactly the same thing as CEFG. So we've kind of just gone back to where we started, but now everything is um, nicely organized. Okay, now we want to understand what um, an indiscernibility between two objects of a category is. And so this, of course, is gonna consist of a lot of information because there's a lot of stuff going on above the level of types. So um, first we ask that um, with respect to A, the two objects A and B that we're interested in behave the same. So they look the same with respect to A. A can't tell the difference between them. So we replace A and B um, in, in capital A 
uh, in all of the possible ways. And then we also need this to, um, we also need T, I, and E to not be able to tell the difference between A and B. And this is going to be modulated by these um, equivalences that are given at the, the A level. So we have all of these guys, all of these equivalences, um, where we're basically um, replacing A and B in um, these spots down here. So then we have to move, um, for example, G along this equivalence that we gave above. Okay, um, so don't read that in detail. The point is that um, the type of indiscernibilities, does, does anyone have a question? See something? <laughs> okay, someone's saying that this slide must have taken time. Yeah, it was uh, difficult getting it all to fit. Okay, so um, the type of indiscernibilities between any two um, terms of CO is equivalent to the type of isomorphisms between A and B in the usual categorical sense. And that's, of course, what we were hoping for. Um, so in particular, uh, just to kind of spell out what's going on here, um, we had these three kind of isomorphisms between the A's. So we can choose one of them. Um, and we see here that um, we're getting an isomorphism, a family of isomorphisms from basically HOM XA to HOM XB. And these, um, in particular, this one by implication between these T's, um, if you write it out, it's saying that this um, isomorphism, if you apply it to G and then compose or pre-compose with F, that's the same thing as applying it to um, G composed with F. And then if you write down in the square, that's just saying that this, these isomorphisms are natural in X. So at least part of this data is giving us natural isomorphisms between these HOM sets, which we know by um, the Uneda lemma is just an isomorphism between A and B, and then all the rest of the data is redundant. Okay, so in the Unilevent structure, in the Unilevent um, category structure, we find that the type of um, equalities between A and B is the same as the type of isomorphisms between A and B. And now we've recovered the um, notion of univalent categories that appeared before in this um, work by Ahrens, Kapolkin, and Shulman. So the theorem is that um, univalent LCAT structures are equivalent to the univalent categories of Ahrens, Kapolkin, and Shulman. So this whole setup generalizes that story. Okay. So we've now exhausted, or at least hopefully explained um, clearly, the notion of indiscernibility and how you would get that um, from one of these structures. Um, and the, if you remember from the beginning of this talk, the story was that we want to understand um, equivalences that are based on um, this notion of indiscernibility. So um, in that earlier paper, they proved that for any two neighborhood categories, um, the type of equalities between the categories themselves are the same as the type of categorical equivalences between them. And so now that we've generalized this notion of univalence to other structures, we also want to generalize the notion of categorical equivalence. So um, the insight is that a categorical equivalence arises as, you might say, a very surjective morphism between um, two structures. And so what that means, the word very basically means that we have um, a surjection between each of um, the pairs of appropriate sorts. So in particular, um, we would say a very surjective morphism between two categories consists of surjections between the two types of objects and between each um, HOM set, AXY, and also AFXFY. And um, then between these two types of compositions and between these two types of equalities for every F and G and between these two types of identities for every F. Okay, so what does this mean when C is univalent? I mean, the idea is that it should reduce to the notion of the usual notion of equivalence. So if we think about univalent L cap plus E structures, then we see the following. So first of all, we have surjections between propositions. So these all have to be propositions 
if the categories are equivalent and it's reduction between propositions, it's just uh, an equivalence of bioimplication. That's the standard from um, type theory, homotopy type theory. And then we also see, so here we have um, a surjection between the HOM sets and um, the fact is that um, if you have a surjection and an equivalence on um, path types, on the identity types um, that the, the function induces, then you have an equivalence. But the fact that um, this uh, equality relation is uh, by implication uh, is exactly saying that um, the path types here are um, the same. So in particular, if we're looking at a univalent category, we can replace E with these equality types. Then we see that the um, that F preserves the equality types. And that's exactly saying that this rejection is an equivalence. OK, so now we're left with something that is um, surjective, or we should say maybe essentially surjective on objects and fully faithful. So this notion of very surjective um, when you look at it in the context of univalent categories, it's just um, an essentially surjective, fully faithful functor. So it's the usual notion of equivalence. Okay, so we use that to define equivalences in general. And so we say that an equivalence between two L structures is a very split surjective morphism between M and N. So it's just like this, without all the pink stuff, um, except that for technical reasons, um, we need to sometimes um, hypothesize that these rejections are split. We don't need to in the case of categories, but it's because categories are particularly well behaved. Um, oops. Okay, so an equivalence um, is a very split surjective morphism, which means that between each of these types, there's a split surjection. Um, and then the theorem that we've proven in this paper is that for any two univalent L structures, M and N, the type of equalities between them is equivalent to the type of these equivalences between them that generalize categorical equivalences. And um, also a, a kind of corollary, which is that um, we can kind of measure the H level of these structures. So if we have um, the type of univalent L structures for a given signature L that has H level, um, well, for when the signature has height N that has H level N plus one. Okay, so here's um, another example um, in the case of magma. So I don't want to write out the example of pre-ordered sets because that's just, uh, um, that's just an instance of the example of categories I just gave, of course. So for the instance of um, magmas, what is an equivalence? Well, it consists of, and here again, for technical reasons, we don't need split surjection, actually. We can just look at surjections. Um, so an equivalence of magmas um, and then P consists of surjection, so a surjection between um, the underlying type and a surjection between these two types of multiplications. And if we look at univalent magmas, then of course these are both propositions and then a surjection between propositions is an equivalence. And then um, we want to ask what's going on here in this um, object set. And basically what's happening is that um, the sense of type of indiscernibilities is tied up with the type of equalities. Um, and we want that this F is an equivalence between the equality types. Um, we can use this um, equivalence between these M's, which make up the indiscernibilities and therefore the equalities to go between um, and equality between two guys, N and M of N O, and then F N and F M. So this surjection turns into an isomorphism. Okay, so an equivalence of univalent magmas just happens to be um, what you would expect. An equivalence of the underlying, or an isomorphism of the underlying sets um, that is basically a homomorphism with respect to the multiplication. Okay, so um, that's it. Uh, so in summary, we've given this notion of signature and for every signature L, we've defined a notion of indiscernibility within each sort 
then from that a notion of unibalanced structures when indiscernibility coincides with equality, um, and then a notion of equivalence, and then a unibalanced theorem using this notion of equivalence, and thus um, we automatically get a higher structure identity principle. And I want to just point out that um, in the paper, the archive version, which is on the title slide, um, we have lots of examples of in, like categories that have extra structure and higher categories and stuff like that. Um, and I also want to point out some uh, future work that we want to do. So I talked a little bit about how um, in the two examples of categories and magmas, we only were talking about um, but just rejections. But in general, for the theorem, you need to postulate that the rejections are split. And uh, the question is, how can we get rid of that? Because in almost all of the examples, we don't need the splitness. And um, then we would also like to formulate an analog of the rest completion. So how can we turn um, a structure that's not univalent into a univalent structure in some kind of universal way? All right, that's it. Thanks. Great, thanks very much. That was great. Um, we can all silently thank Paige now. Okay. Um, and now I'll open the floor to questions. I guess, I'll, sorry, go ahead. You go ahead. All right. Uh, I vaguely remember that Mackay has a notion of equivalence between um, L structures. Uh, and I, I thought it was had something to do with like a span of maybe very surjective morphisms as opposed to a single very surjective morphism. Um, am I completely misremembering or is there no. a reason that the span sort of reduced to a single morphism in your case? Yeah, yeah. So he does have the spans and because um, we impose this univalence condition, then the spans are really equivalences that can kind of be inverted. So it's all, all the same. Right. So your notion of equivalence might be like some sort of weaker notion of equivalence between non-univalent L structures. But in the case of univalent L structures, it recovers his notion of equivalence, which is kind of more symmetrically defined, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Because, yeah, so we only focus on the univalent case. That's what we're really interested in. And then if, since they're the, I mean, in particular, the um, just the surjections that a priori are only going in one direction are um, equalities, then the, the spans of, of two surjections and just one surjection all, all turn out to be the same. Great, thank you. Yep. Can, I, can I stick in a moment there? So yep. uh, another thing about Mackay's definition is that Mackay is defining the relation of two structures being equivalent, whereas uh, the definition that Paige gave actually defines the type of equivalences between two structures. Uh, and uh, in order to modify Mackay's definition to give you the correct type of equivalences, you kind of have to assume everything is univalent and if the vertex of the span is also univalent and then it gives you the, 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 the same thing. Oh. So can I try a kind, of, a kind of conceptual version of this question of Emily's in, in a sense? So, mm -hmm. I mean, supposing you're not I mean, supposing you're not only dealing with univalent things, right? Um, I mean, you might imagine that a way to think was that, and so you've got a theorem, right? Your univalent kind of, you say two things are equal if and only if um, they're equivalent, right? Now, I mean, and that's something for univalent things. Right? Now, supposing one of them isn't univalent, is that then false? So you've got M and N, M's univalent and N isn't. Has it done become false that M equals N if and only if M is equivalent to N? So Interestingly, the theorem actually only uses the hypothesis that M is univalent. Right. I, don't know. I kind of thought that might yeah. happen, you see, because, I mean, then there's a question of, um, you know, if I said of something, so, so now let M and N both be 
not univalent. And supposing it's the case for that for M, for every N, it's the case that M equals N if and only if M is equivalent to N. Does it follow that M is univalent? In other words, does the univalence theorem characterize univalence? Do you see what I mean? It's a philosophical question about what's happening here. Do you know? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would say, I, I don't know if any of the co-authors have an intuition for this. I would say no, but based on some technical difficulties we have with proving these theorems, um, we have, yeah, so um, strange things are happening here, which is that um, we can, in, in certain cases, pull indiscernibilities back along a morphism, but not push them forward mm -hmm. and things like that, which I think is, we have to understand yeah. why yeah. our theory is deficient in that way. Um, but maybe, yeah, with, with a, what, once we understand that, maybe then that, that question would have a good answer. Yeah. So in the case of categories, that is a characterization of the univalent categories because we have this res completion operation yeah. that yeah. every category is equivalent to a univalent one. And so if it has this property, then it's equal to that univalent one. And so it is univalent. Um, we don't know whether in general there's a res completion. So in a, in a sense, that's kind of a, a very similar question. Thanks. Great talk, by the way. Thanks. Okay, we've got time for more questions. Um, could you could you say something more about this splitness issue, please? You said the split subjection thing. What? How that comes? Yeah. In? Um. Yeah. So th this is um, going back to I guess what I was hinting at, which is that there's some. Um, so there's, there's some issues with um, pushing forward uh, indiscernibilities. And if, if we could do that, then we wouldn't need, um, we wouldn't, sorry, I, I may be getting a bit too technical. Um, do you want to say something about split essentially surjections? No. <laughs> okay. I was, I, I was that, wondering if that was what he was worried about. No, no I, 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 I wasn't so precise. I don't, I don't understand. I was just, you said it, so I, I, I was just asking for more information, that's all. Yeah, so, so something very strange is happening. Maybe I'll just say something about the technicalities. Where um, for the theorem to go through, we want to um, be able to push indiscernibilities along a morphism. And um, it doesn't work for some reason. Uh, it's not entirely clear if that's not for some deficit in my intelligence. Um, but so, so we use the splitness to get something that um, will transport the indiscernibilities. But there's something, so in the case of magmas, things are very easy because it's such a, a low level that at some point you want to um, push forward an equality uh, or an indiscernibility and you're just looking at propositions, so um, it works. But in the case of categories and everything categorical, everything that we want to talk about, um, there's an interesting, um, not, not a duality in the technical sense, but there's an interesting notion of um, these indiscernibilities, which are saying something about um, the behavior of objects with respect to like the whole structure. So it has this huge quantification over the whole category. But in the case of categories and really everything else that we like, um, there's a local characterization where an isomorphism is just some maps and stuff like that. So there's a, there's a characterization that just um, consists of some witnesses, not of um, quantification over the whole category. And um, in those cases, you can push forward the indiscernibility without a splitness condition. So the splitness condition is to take care of um, cases where we don't have a local a notion of isomorphism. Um, maybe that, that was too technical. We do have examples of structures where indiscernibilities are not preserved by all morphisms of structures. 
right? Yes, but not not surjections. Right, right. So, yeah. But to, just just to make that point, the, yeah. the, in, it, your in categories we're familiar with the fact that any functor preserves isomorphisms, but for these general indiscernibilities, things can get weird. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thanks. Right. Any further questions? We have time for another one. Uh, yes. Go ahead. Uh, some, some. There's been three or four decades discussion of weak higher categories um, with various kinds of motivations. I'm wondering whether your methodology um, could reproduce the conclusions um, of um, you know what was the right ideas and the wrong ideas of um, weak higher categories. Yeah, so um, we can reproduce many um, different algebraic structures. So given the, a definition of um, a weak higher category based on, you know, different um, machinery, we can reproduce that in these structures. Um, so I, I don't think it speaks so much to the notion of weakness inside a category, but then given the structure, you of course automatically end up with notions of equivalence that usually are the, the right notions, the expected notions that people have always used. Okay, well maybe that's a good point to stop the formal proceedings. So let's all thank Paige again. And our next talk is at 10.30 a.m. tomorrow. Mitchell Riley will be speaking, so I hope to see you all there. <laughs>